Images. Images, yes, but more, much more. Each one a symbol, a quest of the soul. Uncovered piece by piece, each one a part of the mystical whole for those willing to search. The Egyptian collection is treasured not only for its antiquity, but also for its symbolic meaning. For Natasha Rambova was a searcher. Even as a child, she was captivating. Born in 1897 in Salt Lake City, Utah, she was christened Winifred Kimball Shaughnessy, the daughter of Mrs. Winifred Shaughnessy Hudnut. Her stepfather, Richard Hudnut, being the wealthy perfumer, and her mother, a world traveler and collector, young Winifred grew up with a worldwide appreciation for fine art. Her artistic talents led her into the Russian ballet of Theodore Kozlov. There she changed her name to Natasha Rambova, a name more fitting her exotic personality the name she chose to literally forage into the arts and sciences in search of nutriment for mind and soul. A woman of many talents, she was set and costume designer, humanitarian, research director for motion pictures. But by the general public, Natasha Rambova was better known as the fascinating wife of Rudolf Valentino, Hollywood's most lasting, worshipped and legendary star. He was so completely captivated by her, he described her as no ordinary woman, but rather like the reincarnation of some mighty goddess of the past. Oddly enough, she did possess a striking resemblance to Nefertiti, the Egyptian queen whom history describes as one of its most dramatic beauties. So beautiful that modern day reproductions of her famous portrait head such as this one are still in demand. Natasha did seem to have more rapport with the past than the present. She understood and felt more comfortable with the mystical rather than the mundane. In a letter, she wrote, My interest in mythology and legend began as a child, as I never read any other kind of book. And when asked to create sets for a certain screenplay, she explained her refusal by saying, It was a modern story, and modern stories have always bored me. In the 1940s and early 50s, she went on two expeditions to Egypt, the country where for centuries symbolism had been the breath of life. There she became a dedicated research scholar and assisted in the translation and recording of texts from ancient Egyptian tombs, including Ramses VI and the shrines of Tutankhamun. And as she worked and traveled, she grew intensely interested in comparative religion and symbolism, and became a respected Egyptologist in her own right. We approach the Rambova collection through several of the beautiful galleries of the Utah Museum of Fine Arts. Natasha donated her collection to the University of Utah, the state of her birth and its permanent home is here at the museum, among so many other beautiful pieces of art. As the boy king Tutankhamen continues to weave his dazzling spell over the minds and hearts of the 20th century, we must remember Natasha was a searcher, and her collection must be viewed with an entirely different perspective. She was not searching for treasures of silver and gold, but for treasures of truth. And since, according to an ancient text, truth does not come into the world naked, but clothed in types and images, we must look at her collection through her eyes 
and see each object as what she called a symbolic piece essential to the reconstruction of religious patterns of Egyptian thought. In 1956, from Egypt, she wrote, I feel that we shall eventually be able to support and prove the contentions of the classical world concerning the great wisdom that was Egypt. When reassembled, this imagery shows an insight and knowledge of the inner workings of man's nature. Now come, still evening on, and twilight gray had in her sober livery all things clad. Those words of Milton's aptly set the mood for embarking into the nether regions of Egyptian symbolism. At death, this is the type of vessel that carried the deceased across the Nile to the burying ground, always in the west, where the sun dies each night. The Egyptians believed in a literal life after death, and a model funerary barge or boat was essential for survival in the afterlife. The barge was believed to carry the soul on the treacherous journey every night along the waters through the realms of the underworld, where demons and monsters try to impede progress and where it is wise to pay tribute to Osiris, the king of the dead. Solemn oarsmen row the barge, but the soul is destined to arrive safely in the east by morning if the body has been properly mummified and will rise again with the sun god, the terrors of the night forgotten, for bathed in the light of morning, each new day brings resurrection and rebirth of the Ka, or soul, as the mighty sun god Ray journeys across the heavens. The belief in a literal life after death was so prevalent that all Egyptian graves and tombs were equipped with whatever necessities they could afford. Uncrafted over 5,000 years ago, this pottery canoe enabled the deceased to travel or fish in the afterlife. It is protected by the heads of turtles to help it maneuver in the water. Birds and animals were sacred to the ancients and were recognized as being essential to man's ecology countless millennia before that ecology ever became threatened. Noted for their antiquity, these archaic stone and ceramic vessels also date back to prehistoric times. Again and again, we see the expanding circles of life that go on forever. This symbol is found in every known ancient culture, like the ripples of water expanding when a stone is thrown into a pond. There are also mountain and water symbols, as well as bird and animal pictures appearing on these mortuary vessels that would have contained food, oil, and other necessities for the afterlife. But eventually, all the food in the jars would be gone. How could more food be produced to sustain the soul in the hereafter? To the ancient Egyptian, any symbolic recreation of an object, person, or god was just as real and functional as whatever was symbolized, for the life source was fluid and could enter into any shape or mold. Therefore, the people began the practice of having miniature models made of daily activities. They believed the models would actually perform the necessary tasks in the afterlife. This wooden plow set assured the deceased of someone to plant and harvest his crop of grain. But all this preoccupation of equipping a tomb did not make the ancient Egyptians a gloomy race. Far from it. Their philosophy being that inasmuch as they were then living in eternity, the time to be happy was now, today, and so they were.
They were lovers of music, and the sistrum was one of their principal instruments. Here only the handle remains of this ancient music maker, but an artist's rendering shows how the sistrum originally looked. It was a metallic instrument. The little metal discs jingled as it was shaken by the handle. Attending an ancient ceremony in honor of the goddess Isis, you could hear the sistrum in the proceedings. Typically, it has the head of the goddess Hathor, protector of women, depicted towards the top. Although alabaster is difficult to work with, it was preferred by the craftsmen because of its aesthetic beauty. Similar in shape to some of the pre-dynastic pottery, these large vessels are beautifully polished pieces of alabaster. But now, see the diversity of form and uniform quality which became so popular during the 18th dynasty, approximately 1400 BC. This was the era when the domestic arts flourished at their highest level. Each shape of jar or bowl, including these smaller ones, indicated a specific purpose, whether it be for unguent, oil, or cosmetic substance. The Egyptians took very good care of the body, for it was essential for resurrection. Imagine a young lady delicately dipping each fingertip into one of these tiny jars to faintly tinge each finger with rosy henna. To line the eyes, a small ivory stick was dipped into a dark powdery substance called coal, not only for beauty, but also for protection from the burning Egyptian sun. Lovers of beauty and beautiful things, the ancients were masters of jewelry making, using sacred carnelian, amethyst, lapis lazuli, and turquoise. Both men and women wore jewelry as much of it was made into magic symbols to protect them from harm or evil. In later years, they copied their favorite stones by decoratively painting faience, a glazed earthenware pottery. Notice the tiny amulets on this beaded necklace. They are in the shape of the ujet eye, one of the most popular symbols of ancient Egypt. It consists of the eye and eyebrow of a human with the markings of a falcon's eye directly below it. It represents the eye of Horus, beloved son of Osiris. Horus often took the form of a falcon since the falcon flies higher in the heavens than any other bird and has the keenest eyesight. For each symbol in the wonderfully complex mythology of this ancient land, there is a story. For the legend of the Ujid Eye, we are told that when the gods were vying for supremacy, wicked Seth murdered his brother Osiris. Consequently, Horus, the valiant son of Osiris, fought with Seth to avenge his father's death. In the struggle, Seth ripped out one of the eyes of Horus, tearing it to shreds. But Thoth, Lord of Wisdom, gathered up the fragments, healed the eye, and returned it to Horus. 
Horus then placed it in his dead father's mouth and brought Osiris back to life. Therefore, the symbol of the Ujit eye became a potent amulet against sickness and was even thought to bring the dead back to life. Here, a delicate finger ring made of faience. Amulets by the dozens were found in Egyptian tombs. Different amulets, each with different magical abilities, were placed on every layer of linen as the body was wrapped and mummified. Tiny pieces of faience, stone and wood, yet carefully carved into little figures and accredited with magical powers. But by far the most popular amulet in ancient Egypt was the beetle or scarab. It was the magic symbol of the sun god, for the beetle emerged from the ground each morning as the sun emerged from the night. It was also a symbol of eternal life, for when the beetle died, the soft part disintegrated, but the shell petrified, turning stone-like, which would, of course, last forever. These tiny soapstone scarabs are no larger than a fingernail, and yet the undersides are intricately carved with all kinds of symbols, bestowing health and longevity to the owner. To the Egyptians, the head was regarded as the center of life and should always be kept above the earth because its preservation was extremely important for existence in the afterlife. Therefore, a headrest was custom-made for each individual. A magic incantation attributes the power of resurrection to the headrest. Since images and statues were real to the Egyptians, no tomb was complete without figures of the gods to assure the departed soul of divine guidance. This ornately painted figure represents the god of Memphis, capital of Lower Egypt. His name, Ta Sokar Osiris. He is portrayed here in mummy form, wearing a broad collar with falcon heads on each shoulder. The upper register depicts the sky goddess Nut with outstretched wings. In her hands are the ostrich feathers, symbols of truth and of the western realm of the dead. She wears the solar disk, symbol of divinity on her head, and the inscription reads, it is I who gave birth to the gods. In the middle register, the winged goddesses Isis and Nephthys give protection to the deceased. And in the lowest register are the four sons of Horus, protectors of the embalmed inner organs. But most important, the figure is hollow, for it once contained on a papyrus scroll the famous Book of the Dead, a very important guidebook for the soul, containing prayers, magic formulas, and the rules of conduct for the afterlife. Carefully wrapped in linen, this miniature mummy is shaped like a very small child, yet when x-rayed, it reveals no bone structure. You see, it was customary for the ancients to shape stones or grain into small Osiris effigies like this one, for these effigies were believed to magically aid the deceased in attaining resurrection and eternal life. Each Osiris effigy had its own small coffinet. Carved out of cedar wood, this mummiform figure has the head of a falcon like the god Horus. Most of the beautiful artwork has been eroded now by time, but again it was decorated with the familiar symbols needed for the nocturnal journey through the shades of the netherworld. 
When asked by Osiris, king of the dead, to perform work, these little faience figures, known as shawabdis, were placed in the tomb to act as substitute workers for the deceased. On the right is the shawabdi for a scribe named Nebha from the 19th dynasty. He was made by hand about 1,000 years before Christ. The hieroglyphic text found painted on the body is from chapter 6 of the Book of the Dead. It is a prayer to Osiris, reading, O Osiris, as for the duties of this man and any work which is to be done in the necropolis and which is to be performed by a working man, behold, I am here to do all these things, whether it be plowing the fields, carrying the sand from the east to the west, and from west to east. Behold, I am here. I am here. The other figure's name is Sunit, a priestly title meaning one who does the goodwill of Re, the sun god. Since he is more recent, approximately 500 years before Christ, he is mold made, enabling his type to be produced in much larger numbers. In early times, one shawabti was usually sufficient, but in later years, the normal number was 401, one for each day of the year and a foreman for each 10 shawabtis. On the Shabako stone, which is probably the oldest known text in existence, now in the British Museum, is written, Great and mighty is the god Ta, through whose mind and word all the spirits were brought forth. He was the creator of all things, the heavenly father, the great one. All gods and men were projections of his intellect. This bronze figure of the god Ta assured the deceased of the deity's divine guidance. Such an exalted god as Ta was portrayed with a human head. In some myth, the tongue of Ta magically turned into the god Thoth, who was usually depicted as having the head of an ibis, a sacred long-beaked white bird. Remember, it was Thoth who healed the eye of Horus. Thoth was the lord of wisdom and divine scribe of the gods. And since the gods could inhabit most any form they wished, Thoth also took the form of a certain type of ape, a dog-headed baboon with the sun disc on his head. Baboons such as this one often appear in sculptures seated upon the shoulders of scribes as if to represent Thoth's divine inspiration. This deotite image could be part of a scribe's reed brush holder or some kind of writing equipment. Scribes were very important people because anything written or painted also had the magical ability to become real. So for life to continue after death in much the same way as in mortality, all kinds of daily activities were recorded in pictorials on slabs of stone. Here the men are carrying the chair of a nobleman. The inscriptions are words actually being spoken by the men and because of their colloquial nature are difficult to translate exactly. But they are saying, act well because of the important person who is in your arms and pay attention to the one in front of your feet. This particular fragment of limestone bas-relief is thought to be a part of a tomb of a noble named Niyank Nasut, who was buried at the necropolis of Saqqara, south of Cairo, approximately 2300 BC. Much later, approximately 1350 BC, the style of art changed, greatly due to the pharaoh Akhenaten, the illustrious predecessor to Tutankhamun and husband to Nefertiti. Notice the attention to detail. He is fashioned here in the manner in which he instructed his craftsmen to portray him. Akhenaten was known as the humanist reformer, the worshipper of only one god, Aton and during his reign, art began reflecting more realistic features and human situations. The ancient Egyptians were the first to discover the art of glassmaking. 
Glass was treasured along with precious jewels. This frail, paper-thin glassware stems from the Ptolemaic period, really exquisite. The shimmering rainbow colors are nature's work, as oxidation over so many years gradually tinted the glass. The tiny vials are for tears. Paid mourners would weep into these small glass vessels, which would then be sealed and buried with the departed. Hundreds of years later, a 19th century poet wrote, all the rarest hues of human life take radiance and are rainbowed out in tears. Although we've only been able to show a portion of it, Natasha Rumbova collected a myriad of symbolic pieces. And yet, what real significance could this array of diversified artifacts possibly hold for the 20th century? In what way can these symbols of lives past enlighten our present lives? Rambova addressed herself to these questions. As she continued her work, she wrote, not only do these myths and symbols serve as a fascinating study of the history of abstract religious thought, but they can also supply an ever-growing need of today for man to recover his lost perspective his veneration of nature, and his sense of oneness with the great divine scheme. We have gained a glimpse into your ancient world, O mighty Ta. These symbols serve to delight our senses and increase our knowledge, and hopefully we, of so modern an era, can mature that knowledge into wisdom. <laughs>